Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mark Schenk, and I'll be hosting this afternoon's webinar on culture and cross-cultural differences between the United Kingdom and the Netherlands. So this webinar is organized by the Dutch Academic Network in the UK. This is a organization run by and for Dutch nationals working in UK higher education and research sectors. And among our goals are to advocate stronger academic uh, cooperation between the Netherlands and the UK, but also promote social and professional interactions between our members. So this webinar is an example of one of the uh, type of activities that we organise. So if you want to learn more about uh, Dan in the UK uh, or become a member, go to dutchacademicnetwork.uk. Before I move to the programme for today, I would also extend a thank you to Cardiff University, who has kindly given us uh, permission to use their uh, Zoom licence. So the programme for today is uh, culture and cross-cultural uh, differences between the UK and the Netherlands. So many of our Dan and UK members are expatriates in the UK and anyone who's moved between countries will have their own personal experiences of cultural differences they encountered, either in professional or social settings, and sometimes pleasant, sometimes unpleasant. And today that is our topic, culture and cross-cultural differences. So the format of this afternoon is that we will have three presentations by uh, three speakers in the area of culture and cultural differences, followed by a panel discussion. Throughout the entire session, please feel free to submit any questions via the Q&A option in Zoom. Uh, we'll keep track of those and we'll use those for the panel discussion. You can also comment and upvote on the uh, on the questions, so that way we can prioritise which questions we ask our panel members. Okay, let's move on to the first presentation. Our first speaker will be uh, the ambassador, uh, the Dutch ambassador to, to the UK, uh, Karel van Oosterdam. An ambassador is really representative of their country and thereby also its culture. And having visited the ambassador's residence in London on one occasion, we were served bitter bottom, so they do keep uh, the Dutch traditions up. So unfortunately, Ambassador Ostrom couldn't join us today because he had uh, engagement with the UK Prime Minister, uh, but he has recorded a presentation, which I will share. So I'll... So I'll hand over to uh, Ambassador Ostrom for the first presentation. Thank you so much, Mark, uh, for that introduction and a warm word of thanks as well to Natalie and both of you, actually, for organizing this webinar, which uh, I really think is uh, very uh, pertinent at this moment. Uh, apologies that I cannot be here uh, uh, live today myself, as I have other obligations which came up at the last moment. Uh, but I promise that I will look to uh, the video of the whole webinar uh, as I'm extremely interested in this subject. Um, before delving into the subject, let me first see how important the network then in UK is, Dutch Academic Network in the United Kingdom. Uh, we really commend you from our embassy for the connections you make. Uh, you're promoting uh, connections between Dutch scientists, but truly also uh, between Dutch and British scientists. And uh, you're a great ally in the post-Brexit world, let me phrase it that way. Uh, and this morning I had an agricultural webinar and we discussed the issue of how if two cultures work together, you get this cross-pollinization, it was an agricultural seminar, and I hope that cross-pollinization um, also works in the, in the science field we're talking about today. Um, I want to start also with a disclaimer, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a professor, I'm just a humble practitioner in the field of uh, diplomacy and intercultural awareness. Uh, I've learned a few lessons in the in the past. I'm still learning. Um, so what I'm going to do is share with you some lessons I've learned, some remaining challenges, questions I have, and some field research, may I say, which I still try to to um, to practice. Let's start with the first slide. If I could ask that. Uh, on the first slide, um, you see um, 
the title of what I'm going to talk about, Diplomacy and Intercultural Awareness. And a part of what I'm going to share with you is based on a book I wrote in 2019, which is called With an Orange Tie, a year on the Security Council, um, about the work we did in 2018. Uh, and two chapters in that book are dedicated about differences between cultures and what it means for your behavior. And I'll, I'll come back to that later on. The structure of my lecture, maybe now on the next slide, please. Uh, some elements, you can read it here, but I'll, I'll start a little bit. What is diplomacy? What's the difference be between multilateral and bilateral? The importance of personal relations in diplomacy, what it means for your own behavior. Uh, what is the definition of a common culture if you talk about intercultural awareness? Uh, some key dimensions, um, three scientists uh, uh, I, I read books from on this issue very practically on the differences between the UK and the Netherlands and one counterpart on Japan on that one. And some observations from the first nine months here in the UK, uh, the, the peculiarities of meeting someone here in the UK for the first time, and then uh, something on communication, a crucial and, uh, subject when it comes to intercultural awareness, um, some um, lost in translation uh, words uh, which struck me here in the UK. And then some uh, general remarks on what I would say communication between different cultures and how to become culturally aware. Let's go to the next slide, please. As I said very shortly, I'm a diplomat uh, in New York. I worked for seven years until last year as a multilateral diplomacy. And as of August, I'm a bilateral diplomat here in London. What is the biggest difference in New York? I worked with 192 other countries. Uh, my my uh, uh, habitat was diplomats, 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 and then maybe five or ten percent non-diplomats. And we are discussing and trying to solve and negotiating about global problems, from climate change to poverty, from non-proliferation to pandemics. Here in London, it's really a different world. Uh, we focus on two countries: the United Kingdom and the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Uh, my natural habitat here is uh, citizens, companies, civil servants my political bosses, of course, and certainly bilateral problems. And it won't surprise you that here in London, the focus of our work is on Brexit and, of course, also on COVID. Um, and then um, the, I, I think the key difference between a diplomat and a scientist, for instance, would be I serve my country. Uh, and I had a discussion a, a little time ago with a, a professor, and she said, I serve truth. I spoke to a lawyer and said, I serve truth justice or the law and i spoke to somebody from a company who said well my life is dedicated to making a profit for me as diplomats i serve my country and i serve the dutch people let's go to the next slide please to be a diplomat to have the uh, the responsibility to work on these kind of issues personal relations are key uh, the picture you see is a start of a football game in the security council it's in June 2018, when Russia had the presidency that month of the Security Council, at the same moment that the World Championships soccer started in Russia, in Sochi. Uh, and my Russian colleague, who you see there in his red Russian T-shirt, uh, organized a football game in the Security Council chambers. I participated uh, also as a gesture towards him uh, that um, we have many difficult issues to discuss with Russia. but participating in this kind of football game uh, creates a bond, creates a little bit of a common understanding, creates a personal relation. To create a personal relation with people from other cultures, it is key that uh, diplomats understand that uh, all people are different and that uh, if you come from a different culture, it may mean that uh, you have a completely set of norms, a paradigm in your head, and it influences what you say, how you say it, when you say it, how you communicate, verbally, non-verbally, uh, and what kind of standard behavior patterns you might see in, uh, in other missions, in other organizations. I will mention three writers. I won't delve too much into them, but I'll mention them uh, for, if you want to, uh, then you know where I'm coming from. Uh, two of them are Dutch. Uh, so, von Stompenaar is here, has, uh, on my slide, is one of the uh, Dutch professor who really did a lot of research on this. He came from Royal Dutch Shell and is one of the international experts uh, when it comes to cultural dimensions. For instance, the first one, universal, universalism versus particularism, or 
um, uh, neutral versus effective, internal direction, external direction. And if you have these kind of um, 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 prisms, you, you can look through um, the, the two uh, opposing terms. And you can basically um, identify a culture where they are on the scale between the two terms. And there's two more uh, books I can really recommend. So the next slide, please. This again is about uh, intercultural awareness and differences. Uh, there's Professor Hofstede, who has also done a lot of re research, uh, for instance, indulgence versus restraint, power distance index, individual or collective. And uh, Aaron Meyer, who is on the right on this slide, uh, who um, uh, has also written a beautiful book. Uh, I call it the yellow book. And also she came up with uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight scales where you can identify a culture. And on Meyer, I will come back later on. Um, we discuss a lot about culture. So um, when, when I joined the Foreign Service, we, in the beginning, we, we I thought culture was about art, poetry, concerts, movies. Uh, but the word culture, as I use it, is something else. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this is my working definition. Uh, common culture, I, I would say, is a perceived shared identity consisting of a set of assumptions, beliefs, and behaviors shared by a group of people and transferred to new members of the group and also between generations. And you see a common culture, for instance, in companies and organizations, in football clubs, and in this context, certainly in countries. Uh, it has many dimensions, uh, the way people make decisions, how they communicate, how they evaluate, how they agree or how they disagree, uh, the, the measure of formality, uh, and the other dimensions I just mentioned uh, from the other, uh, from the three scientists I mentioned. But in this context, in this subject, and let's go to the next slide, what struck me from coming from New York to London, how much context matters. In New York, I felt very strongly, and the picture to the left is my prime minister meeting Donald Trump with Theresa May uh, behind him and me behind Theresa May. To the right is the, the meeting between my, the two prime ministers of the two countries where I'm looking on. The context matters. In New York, I felt very strongly that there was a strong common culture between the UK and the Netherlands. Uh, whereas the distance between uh, us Western Europeans and countries, uh, diplomats from, for instance, from Costa Rica to South Africa, from Namibia to Laos, um, it was clear that the distance in all these skills I mentioned are, are much more different. So I came here to the UK basically expecting that that similarity I would see also see also now that I'm especially working with the UK. The funny thing is that context has changed and suddenly the distance between our two cultures for me personally has become much more obvious. And let's go to the next slide. I took the liberty of doing a, a poll in our in our embassy here in London uh, and asking a number of my colleagues two of the key dimensions, I would say, uh, uh, of all these um, uh, skills I mentioned from Meyer and from uh, Tom Penaas and from Hofstede, I took to the power distance, hierarchical or egalitarian, that's the vertical scale. And from left to right, you see the scale, whether the culture is predominantly an individual, if someone sees him, him or herself as an individual or as a member of a group. And this is more or less what came out of it, that the Dutch are um, a, a more individual, more egalitarian than the British, who are more hierarchical and feel themselves more part of a group uh, group uh, within society usually. But, um, so that's, that's two differences, two key dim dimensions. It was just a, a simple poll in our embassy. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, uh, here, and I hope it's possible, Mark, that we can share this PowerPoint with all participants. This is more scientific research by Aaron Meyer, and I, we looked at this, this up afterwards. You see the same that the difference between the UK and the Netherlands, for instance, let's look at the, um, uh, which one I wanted to say. Um, well, let's, let's take uh, the second, for instance, uh, giving negative feedback or not. Um, the second line says uh, direct negative feedback or indirect negative feedback. Um, our honorary consul in Hull said at a certain moment to me, Karel, um, the British are too polite to be honest and the Dutch are too honest to be polite. 
you see that a little bit on the second scale. Uh, in general, uh, one can say that the British are a little bit more uh, towards, I would say, Asian values, which are more indirect, they're more right way on the scale. But fascinatingly enough, uh, if you look at the differences between Japan and the Netherlands, which is a right picture on this screen, you see that when it comes to uh, making decisions, um, uh, Japan uh, is extremely consensual. So there it's all the way to the left, and for the rest it's all uh, more uh, 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 Asiatic. But when it comes to decision making, it's really building a consensus, which of course is a, a very strong Dutch characteristic as well. Um, so this, these are some general introductions on the differences we see. Um, this is in the back of my head all the time when I interact with colleagues. Um, so um, I also talk to colleagues and, and having met a lot of uh, British people now, it feels a little bit that I'm searching for the DNA of the British people, which of course is impossible. But I'll share some observations from, I would say, from my work and let's define that in the context of a science seminar as my amateur field research. Uh, let's go to the next slide, uh, please. Um, it's very interesting to see here in the UK uh, what one can do in the first meeting or not. Uh, what do you do? How do you introduce yourself? What are safe subjects you talk about? It really strikes me, but I'm, I'm very interested in the observation of all of you. You lived here much longer that one of the key characteristics in the UK is a fear of either embarrassing yourself or embarrassing uh, the person you're talking to. So there's a very safe subject a series of subjects which in the uk are favorite in first time people meet the weather sports pets royalty uh, even the pub or which pub do you go to and it's also quite clear there's a number of no-go areas at least that's my observations and i'm very interested in what others will say later in the, in the day uh, politics is not a good area uh, private life i had a meeting with a, a british company who wants to invest in in the netherlands uh, huge investment i tried to get him talking about his uh, his family no way whereas the moment i talked about football he really um, it started the conversation religion is sensitive sharing emotions or emotional issues in first meeting is uh, is not good and talking about sex there are not that many countries where that is uh, useful in your first meeting but certainly in the uk uh, that would be an embarrassing issue uh, my next observation it's uh, about language uh, for me a key issue as a diplomat can we go to the next slide please um, it's, it's wonderful to see which words, and at a certain moment, a couple of days, I was, I was jotting down how many times I hear the, the words in any conversation. It's striking that here in the UK, it is such a polite civilization compared to, compared to the Netherlands. Please, thank you, sorry. Uh, um, words I hear so often, and I never understood uh, since I've, I've, I've checked this, why Elton John, sorry, seems to be the hardest word. It's certainly not true in the UK. I think it's the, the most easily used word. But also in any conversation, my counterparts will so often say, oh, you're brilliant. Oh, that's fantastic. So very kind, very outgoing, very, but also very um, humble, I would say. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, the, the, the use of language here is so different from the Dutch that there are many words which are, men, uh, are understood, are not, are not understood in the right way. Typical, well, typical, uh, is extremely negative, I would say, whereas a uh, Dutch person would say, okay, it's typical, okay, interesting. Uh, interesting, the, the word I just mentioned, interesting, uh, if, to a Dutch word would say, oh, I said something interesting. But to a British person who says interesting, it basically means, oh, this was absolutely nothing. And also words like, I beg your pardon, uh, it's, um, we think, oh, he says, sorry, no, someone feels assaulted, or with all due respect basically means, at least as my observation, contradict me later on if you don't agree, with all due respect basically is an announcement, now I'm going to insult you. Uh, but it's it's a nice way, uh, it's a nice observation. I think that a lot of these words are lost in translation, certainly to the Dutch mind. There's even a whole website, I'll go to the next slide, please. And I'll give you some example. If a British person says, that's not bad, uh, uh, the British usually mean that's good. Uh, what a Dutch person would hear would be, that's poor, or uh, that's a very brave proposal. 
that's what someone says, a UK person. What is meant is you're insane. Uh, and many Dutch people would say, well, you think I have courage. Uh, and another example is uh, also from real life. We had a, a Dutch civil, uh, uh, we had a group of civil servants over um, two years ago here at the embassy. Uh, I wasn't here yet, but this is a story told by one of my colleagues. Went to a meeting with her counterparts uh, at, the, at the British ministry. The British counterpart said, well, I'm not an expert on these issues. And then he gave the most brilliant analysis. When the Dutch person open said, well, thank God, I am an expert. I will tell you how it really is. Uh, so a very good example of miscommunication. Uh, so it's useful to have these kind of, I would say, subtexts in what is happening. Let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, it's a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, uh, um, the danger of uh, the science of intercultural awareness the danger is, of course, stereotyping, negative stereotyping, positive stereotyping, uh, very easily um, uh, falling into the trap of uh, generalizations uh, and even uh, coming to pre uh, the prejudice. Um, so I think I also have to realize when uh, interacting with people from other uh, countries, it's useful to prevent misunderstandings to really know what is happening so what i try to do and i've really i've been trained my, my ministry gives training to our diplomats to work on it i have to listen more i have to observe better also look at the the way people express themselves the the non-verbal signals i try to prepare myself i read a number of wonderful books about um, british culture and the history of the uk uh, and all the time i have to see the individual I shouldn't see someone as a, a Chinese or a bit. No, there's an individual person there. And also very important for myself, I have to be aware of my own paradigm. Through what lens am I looking to the other? Uh, and finally, uh, I never give up searching. I feel a constant search for the secret DNA of the other. What makes the other tick? What is happening? What is the most important thing, of course, is of uh, intercultural awareness. And that's why I'm so, so interested in the service is to prevent misunderstanding. That if someone tells me something, that I get a subtext and then I know what he or she meant. Was it yes? Was it no? Was it maybe? Uh, and that can really be a different subject in many uh, different cultures. Last slide, and then I'm almost finished. Uh, diplomacy and intercultural awareness is also in my book. Some mistakes I made, things which work in any culture, safe subjects in many other countries. And, uh, if you're interested in the book, it's available on Amazon, but more important, maybe um, there are some more subjects and chapters also on my website. And uh, send me an email on this email if you're interested in the subject or would like to share your observations. And I'm really looking forward to discussion later this afternoon. Back to you, Mark and uh, Natalie. Thanks so much. So thank you very much to the ambassador for his presentation. It's, it's fascinating to see that a professional in representing Dutch culture also takes an academic interest in, in their profession and academic research. It's also very nice to see the perspective of a new arrival on the UK shores and how to learn, learning how to work with the British. And I think many of us will recognize uh, some of the experiences that I just described. So going from learning how to work with the English uh, to a more general discussion about culture and what makes us different, I'd like to hand over to Professor Ron Fisher from the Victoria University of Wellington. Uh, Ron, are you able to share your screen? Um, you have to stop sharing yours, and I happily can go with mine. All right. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great honor to be here. And I want to zoom out and connect to some more basic themes about culture uh, to provide a more uh, academic perspective on some of the topics that the ambassador already mentioned. I think I, I first have to step back and probably remind us that as a species, we are actually, we have an incredible success story. You know, we're the only species that has managed to um, 
basically occupy and, and populate the whole planet. And what has enabled that, you know, like as we were, you know, like moving around the world, encountering all sorts of different environments. So from desert environments to tropical, um, you know, like forests all the way, you know, like um, a very young me, you know, like playing around with a small snowman. Um, so very hostile cold weathers. What has really enabled us to do that is culture. Um, Back in the days when we started to move, move out of Africa, we started developing very simple tools. And, you know, like as we were encountering, you know, Neanderthals in, in Europe, for example, our ancestors started developing, for example, these bone flutes that you can see here, very simple, seemingly simple, but, you know, like they're already, already tuned and, you know, like they match, you know, you have to imagine that's like 50,000, uh, 40,000 years ago, these tools that our ancestors produced match, you know, like musical instruments that were produced um, in medieval Europe, um, you know, way later. And then obviously, I mean, the, the fact that we can talk to each other right now um, is also, you know, like an example of the great success of, of cultural artifacts, cultural products um, like telecommunication that enables us to talk to each other and exchange views. Again, this enables us to, you know, work, live and uh, interact in, in, in a way that no other species has done before us. And when we talk about uh, cultural products that enable us to do things, we probably also have to think about the one thing that um, enables so many other things. If we have access to uh, money or economic resources these days, this enables a whole lot of other things that allows us to solve problems. And I will come back to that. So I, I would like to basically just remind us that actually culture, even though we have all these cultural differences, also enables us to do a lot of things that basically other species have been unable to do so. I just want to invite you, unfortunately, you know, the, the issue with uh, these uh, online seminars is we can't really interact. But, you know, I just want to invite you to, to look at this um, object and then just think about what could this be? Um, I just want to use this to also demonstrate the power of culture. You may think, what is this? A radiator, some kind of support mechanism, maybe for... Um, you know, like some contraption in your kitchen or what might, what could that be? Um, and I don't know if you have thought about it. It's actually a music instrument. Very few of us would ever think that this contraption here is actually anything that you could use for playing music. But this also demonstrates the power of culture. Once we know what it is, we can't unthink it. You know, like once we see this again, we immediately know what it is used for. And, you know, like once you get some practice, also how to use it for, you know, whatever purposes, right? So this is also the power of culture. It gives us um, tools that may not be obvious to others that come from a different cultural background, but once we have that, te that technology and we have the knowledge, we have the insights of how to use it, it will enable all sorts of other things, like, for example, playing some music um, when, when you want to be with your friends and enjoy a good time, right? So our evolutionary legacy, you know, moving out of Africa, our big brains, our, you know, like social living structures, both enable and constrain cultural variability. So, and I think this is actually one of the most important points that, uh, as the ambassador said, you know, like we are all very similar, but there are important nuances and differences. Uh, but these differences often are not uh, random or, you know, like wild or crazy. We can actually um, understand where these differences come from and we can start unpackaging them. So when we look around uh, the world, I have done a lot of work on, for example, cultural rituals. The first thing that is often striking is there are all these amazing um, behavioral displays that seem so alien. In psychology and related disciplines though, instead of looking at these uh, often fascinating behavioral 
um, manifestations, what we tend to do is we try and understand how people actually think about this. Uh, so instead of looking at a car like uh, up there that may look very old fashioned and, and bizarre, um, we actually open the hood and look underneath. What is the engine? You know, like how does the engine work? So how do we think about what is going on? So this is um, bringing us back to, you know, some of the authors that the ambassador already mentioned, um, for example, Hofstede, you know, like the focus on values to what he called the collective programming of the mind. So this is what researchers have used to start unpacking unpackaging the differences around the world to create world maps. You know, like here's a um, Babylonian map. So this is, again, one of our commonalities around the world. We try and understand our world and create maps that help us navigate our social environment. How it is typically done here is an example from the World Value Survey, where you ask representative samples from around the world um, certain questions. For example, how important is it to you to think up new ideas and be creative to do things your own way or how important is tradition and then you know like across representative samples you can um, tally that up and for example the balance between these two questions here that you see here uh, shows that uh, on average Dutch participants in 2005 are much more likely to say it's important for them to do their own thing and Brits are much more likely to say tradition is important. Again, echoing some of these distinctions that the ambassador already uh, indicated in, in the poll in the Dutch embassy there in London. But the important thing now is, how do we make sense of this? And here I want to briefly mention um, a very important Dutch researcher, uh, Nico Tinbergen, who in 73 got uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, who reminds us we always have to ask four different questions and, and any kind of behavior can be broken down um, using those four questions, you know, like what is actually uh, initiating or driving the behavior in a specific situation. So the context that the ambassador uh, talked about, um, what actually makes the behavior appear over our evolutionary history? How does the behavior develop over the lifetime of an individual? And also, how did that behavior come about and what is the function um, in, a, in a specific context? And those four questions, uh, they have been really important since the 1960s, 70s. And for example, David Sloan Wilson's recent book on you know, like completing the Darwinian revolution goes back and, and highlights the importance of those four questions for understanding um, behavior, especially human behavior. And so bringing us back to those uh, four questions, uh, the idea of our behavior being learned is really essential in, in the social sciences and in psychology. And so what we encounter very on early on in our lives is kind of a weather forecast of what is going to happen in our lives, right? So the conditions that we encounter very on, very early on in our um, you know, development and the opportunities that we have to, to solve any kind of problems are really crucial for us to you know, calibrate our future behavior. And so this brings me back now to the idea of these different environments that humans have encountered around the world and the resources that we have. So here, I just quickly want to mention a very interesting theory by another Dutch researcher, Evert van der Vleert, who argues that humans, you know, like as they encounter these climatic challenges, you know, like as a warm blooded species, you know, like in, in, in tropical environments, it's easy for us to uh, regulate our temperature, it's easy for us to find food. So there are not a lot of challenges. On the other hand, if we get in very hot, very hot or very cold environments, you know, like this is creating stresses for us. And to the extent that we have the financial resources today um, to buy food, to um, thermoregulate our, our environments, to build good houses, or, you know, like um, air conditioning, then if we have the resources and we can overcome these challenges, we start thriving, we become creative, we become innovative because we have the resources to do so. On the other hand, if we lack resources, then we start to become more conservative, more traditional because there's safety in numbers and it, it's better not to try and be, you know, like the smart ass and go out there and do something that may actually be very risky or dangerous. So in the, in the end, what we have is a very um, nice balance, nice or, you know, like uh, delicate balance between the 
demands in our environment and the resources that individuals have available. And this now brings me back also to the, that graph that I showed you early on between um, Dutch participants and British participants, right? Because um, obviously the weather is an important topic in conversations, but there's actually much more to the weather um, than meets the eye at the first sight. Uh, because there are economic differences per capita between Holland and the UK, right? So on average, a Dutch person will have a little bit more money available to them than a British person. And then if you plot now these differences in um, the average income to, you know, like differences in climate stress, you will also see that the Dutch have a slightly more demanding climate in their, um, in their country to deal with. So slightly colder winters um, compared to the British, right? And so now if you start throwing this into um, the balance, so the Dutch most likely according to these um, theoretical explanations, they encounter more challenges early on in their lives, but they also, due to their, the higher income, they can overcome these challenges. So they start creating inno innovative, creative ways to overcome these kind of problems, build dams, build nice houses, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas the British not being faced by that many climatic challenges, but also not having that many resources, you don't actually stimulate potentially some of these creative energies. And this is pretty much what we find here. Um, I quickly show you an analysis of representative, representative samples uh, from around the world. Um, that's, uh, I think, 60 countries around the world. And what I plotted here is the climatic demands that these individuals face. Up here, you see whether they indicated the it's more important for them to be creative or innovative. And down here, whether uh, they feel a bit more traditional. And then whether they have a lot of economic resources available to them on average, or that, so that is basically at the individual level. So whether individuals feel they have the economic resources available to them, or whether they feel they don't have the economic resources available to them. And Holland and the UK are about here. So you, you can start seeing, you know, like a possible reason why we saw these differences earlier on in the um, relative importance of, you know, being creative or being a bit more conservative traditional, uh, because it can be understood as one, uh, one driving mechanism can be this interaction between these demands that we face in our environment and the resources that we have to deal with them. So bringing me back to the initial point, our evolutionary legacy enables and constrains cultural variability. And here I want to just briefly mention um, a British researcher, Kevin Leyland, who's doing really interesting work on this interaction between these demands and resource issues, uh, particularly in um, animal, various animal models. But more recently, his work has also been um, expanded to human populations. And you know the term extended evolutionary synthesis that he helped to create provides really new interesting insights that help us understand why humans on average sometimes behave in somewhat unexpected or different ways. And the important thing is it's not unexpected. We just start to really understand and unpackage where these differences come from. So our human success story is really the combination of an adaptation to vastly different environments with really different demands on us. So what food is available? How do we deal with uh, really cold or hot environments? And the cultural resources that people have available to them kind of set a, a weather forecast for life. And so in order to understand these differences, these mental maps that we have today, we have to start also thinking a little bit about you know, the interaction between economics, biology, and focus on some of these developed developmental patterns. So there are rich other aspects to look into, but I think it's sometimes good to step back. As we noted, you know, like the climate, the weather is something that we always talk about. Um, maybe we don't talk about money, but these two things, once we start really looking at them together, we start understanding some of these subtle differences and why people may behave slightly differently and different environments. So thank you very much. If you have questions, if you want to know a bit more about some of this research, um, email me or you know, send me a message. And also, you know, like some of these ideas I explain a bit more in this book. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion later on.
Thank you very much, Ron. Culture, the secret to our success. I'd never thought about culture in, in, in those terms. And the fact that the weather impacts culture is again, another something I've never really even considered. But also good to see that scientifically shown that the British like traditions, um, a, a stereotype confirmed for those who live in this country. <laughs> So thank you very much, Ron. Uh, hopefully there'll be time for some questions after our next talk. So I'd like to hand over to uh, Natalie from the MERS, who will be talking about the cultural differences between the UK and the Netherlands. Before she starts though, I'd like to point out that Natalie has also been driving force behind this webinar and has been taking care of all the organization. So thank you, Natalie, for uh, setting this up. Uh, Natalie, are you happy to share your screen? Yes. Here we go. So Mark, thank you. And um, as one of the members of Dan in the UK, I'm really excited to do this talk on Dutch and British cultural differences. I specifically want to dedicate this talk to my father. Um, he is the one who taught me to always look for the individual and he tra uh, traveled extensively and would go for places that nobody else would necessarily venture. So really, is this a big deal then? Us, right? We're kind of neighbors. There's a North Sea between us, and we're so similar in terms of our geographical location, our wealth, and our climate. And I think it's really interesting that all three of us um, mention how we talk, or maybe don't talk about the weather. But we are dissimilar in terms of the things that matter for collaboration. And so this is what I'd like to discuss in this brief talk. And of course, I'm going to mention directness and indirectness and focus on whether it's polite to be transparent. I will also link that to diversity and inclusion, a very hot topic in the social sciences and a must nowadays for any modern organization or institution. And I'm gonna start with the underdog and what it means for both countries. So the British really like the underdog. It is the person or the team with the least potential to win. And it links to their values of liberty and freedom, and of course, harps back to the Magna Carta. And what that means is that in reality, in a working environment, when somebody else makes a total blunder and you point that out, you're the one to blame. And it might also mean that um, if you are thinking of praising someone explicitly in a meeting or in the classroom, that might not be well received. Now, this isn't quite the same as act normal, you're acting crazy enough as it is. This first appeared in 1934, so not that long ago, but it is linked to the Protestant work ethic. And what this means is that we need to be aware of crossing these invisible boundaries of normalcy. So please be aware of bragging, flashing dis flashy displays, or showing emotions. And what is important then is to find out, okay, what, what are the drivers of these differences? And of course, um, the ambassador and Ron have already looked at this, but let's look at the Dutch and the British in a little bit more detail. So here we see this Hofstede um, comparison, and you can do that via very easily through the website Hofstede Insights. And as you can see, unlike um, perhaps what Ron and the ambassador said, but in this instance, both the Dutch and the British are on par when it comes to hierarchy, low on power distance. They are actually high on individualism, so the, the importance of the self versus the group. Where it differs is this um, difference between masculinity and femininity. Now, you have to forgive Hofstede, this was maybe a little bit of an unfortunate term, but what he meant was that masculine, masculinity is about power and achievement and valuing that, whereas femininity is about work-life balance and nourishing, and perhaps that explains why the Dutch will leave the office at five o'clock. There are some other little differences, such as uncertainty avoidance, the Dutch maybe avoid risk a little more, and they are also more long-term orientated. But I guess in uh, what another thing that is similar between the two is that they like to party. Now, the thing about this, um, this kind of work is that it could be argued to, to be called uh, sophisticated stereotyping. Of course, you're taking a, 
a whole country and you're not really looking at the regional nuances, for example. So um, what I want to do next is to look at both the British and the Dutch in a little bit more detail. And I'm going to talk about research that spans the decades. I have selected only a few sources. And um, even though it, I have to admit that it isn't the most popular um, comparison in academic research, there are a lot of papers out there. Um, but these, I think, will be interesting for our present discussion. So Tayeb, back in 1993, said that the British are individualistic, self-controlled, and have a strong sense of fair play, but they're also xenophobic, reserved, and conservative. Now, isn't that paradox interesting, and could it potentially explain Brexit? In my own research, I found that the British managers were more concerned about inconvenience, and it's funny that the ambassador has also observed that. So they'd like to prevent awkward and uncomfortable situations from happening or difficult questions from being asked. And this in general is actually known as saving face. But in the literature, what you see more often is a bigger comparison between, for instance, Asian countries and the West. The Riches also have a very special way of expressing values and opinions that can confuse people. And it's obviously linked to not want to inconvenience people. Um, but sometimes these paradoxical meanings are not clear to others. And what is interesting about this specific reference, and I will give you all my references at the end, is that this was published in a medical journal. But obviously for that particular medical field, it was interesting enough to have a look at this because people had to work together. This is a quote from my own uh, research, qualitative data. The British seem to take themselves a lot less seriously than any other race I have ever encountered and don't mind a joke sarcasm, laughing at themselves, etc. This in itself can lead to a lot of misunderstanding when the other party doesn't understand humor or sarcasm or the vein in which it's meant to be taken. So let's now then look at the Dutch. The Dutch are also paradoxical, interestingly, in that they are known to be sober, regulated and conformist, but also progressive, tolerant and challenging of convention. Now, there is a saying in the Netherlands, um, or at least there is an observation about the Netherlands, that Amsterdam is a liberal city in a conservative country. So are we actually looking here at maybe a rural and urban difference? In daily work life, the Dutch have been accused of being direct. Gosh, tell us something new. But here I want to emphasize something and the importance of assumed cultural fluency. Now, if I start to speak with you with the most strong Dutch accent, and this is really my uh, best uh, Dutch football coach, then of course, if you are an English person, you might say, okay, so she's a, a foreign and she might make mistakes. But it doesn't necessarily mean that if I speak fluent English, that they also have cultural fluency. And so what then happens is that even though you can be fluent in English, you might still make cultural faux pas. Now, some research that is slightly linked to this, but which I find fascinating, and actually Ron could uh, talk a little bit more about this because he was involved, is Michelle Galfand's tightness and looseness. So the Netherlands score is 3.3 and it scores higher than the UK. So it's, if you like, more tight. One of the items that they asked was, in this country, if someone acts in an appropriate way, others will strongly disapprove. Now, isn't that something that links to act normal? You're acting crazy enough as it is. And um, as um, the ambassador mentioned, uh, von Strompenaars has done a lot of research uh, on his own dimensions and uh, worked for Shell. And in one of the publications for Shell, he actually said that the British had complained that the Dutch asked why too often. But maybe that has something to do with that tightness, with wanting to do things in the appropriate way. Now, I'm being magnanimous about this slightly because this is actually one of the quotes that I got back based on my research. I was wondering whether this extremely poorly set up inquiry has been evaluated at some level within the company. Is HR involved? I hope that this inquiry is not representative for the new fashion of diversity. If so, everybody within the company will probably be very pleased to see it die away in silence in a couple of years. 
Right. Thank you very much. I think you've just illustrated what I'm trying to observe. So can we tie a rope on this, as we say in Holland? Um, and of course, as uh, the ambassador mentioned, um, Erin Meyer has done some great work kind of gathering all that secondary data and making it really useful uh, and, in, in, and uh, approachable. And this is a, um, a, one of those visuals that's gone viral on the internet. So again, yes, what the British say, this is an original point of view. What it's, it meant is your idea is stupid. And what the Dutch understand is they like my ideas. But what I would like to do at this junction is to go in deeper a little bit about what this means. And therefore, I think what we need to look at about that what is normal for the spider is chaos for the fly. So this is based on some research that I've done, and um, I'm going to just carefully explain this quite dense graph. Now, on the left hand side, you see the communication style consultative, and this is a socially desirable communication style, but asking questions and listening very carefully. And as you can see, both the Dutch and the British, grey and yellow, score themselves high on being consultative. But what I did was I also asked them how they perceived the other. And as you can see, they rated the other as lower on consultative. Now, this is probably one of those general um, findings that we see a lot in social psychological research. We see ourselves in a better light than we see the other. However, the, the, what we uh, measure is can be, of course, culturally subjective. So as you can see, the Dutch rate themselves low on indirectness and the British are higher, even on par um, really um, with how, the consult how they were perceived as being consultative. However, what is interesting is that the Dutch see the other as more indirect than they, they see themselves. And the British rate the Dutch as very low on indirectness. When it comes to directness, the Dutch, yep, we think we are direct and the British are actually on par with their own indirectness evaluation. But when they are viewed as the other, the Dutch say no, the British are not direct at all. Whereas the British rate the Dutch as more direct than the Dutch would rate themselves. So the key difference here is in this perceived directness or indirectness. And Lau recently found a significant difference in how direct British and Dutch participants support themselves. So there was this element of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And this is not isolated to communication styles. Um, there is research out there that uh, find that people exaggerate group differences on the traits that they are defining features of the stereotype. So for instance, AL and Epley, what they found in terms of gender differences was that men would rate women higher on empathy than women would rate themselves. So that then links nicely into diversity and inclusion because we are not simply Dutch or British. We are a queer Dutch woman or a black Brit and this is intersectionality. And it's important because this is what matters for our multicultural diverse working environment. Now, I'm going to talk about that topic that you're not supposed to mention, money. And the European gender employment gap is 18%, but the Dutch gap is bigger. What is more is that research found that when people were reviewing funding calls, they found significant differences in the evaluation and the success rates between men and women. And Suzanne Tauber at Groningen has done some research that found that women leave academia due to the lack of psychological safety. Interestingly enough, in the UK, that gap is about the white and global majority academics. So the white academics do better than the global majority. And what is interesting here in terms of the assessment of publications and funding, they also found ethnic and racial biases. So I think within higher education, we've got our work cut out. And indeed, the conclusion that was drawn was that universities have yet to develop fully inclusive processes to provide true equality of opportunity for staff and students. In a meta-analysis, Webster argues that for the LGBTQ community, 
what we can do is form allyship, not mentorship where there's some kind of status difference, real allyship. Actually, diverse teams can benefit from being different from one another because it increases creativity. But there is the challenge of increased conflict and that requires management. So how do we get to yes? And actually this is the title of one of Erin Meyer's talks as well. Um, sorry, one of her articles, but also actually it harps back to a book published by Yuri and Fisher. And here I've worked together with a consultant um, who works for one of the uh, British global banks. And the key skill is a bit of humility. Let's all recognize that we have some things to learn. And so when you actively listen and at the end of the meeting, you want to avoid those misunderstandings, what you could do is to say, what I'm hearing is dot, dot, dot. You can also try to be cur uh, curious, but stay away from judgment. So what you can do is question kindly. Instead of asking what, <laughs> you might say, tell me more. What makes you say that? And then it takes a bit of courage. We don't know what success looks like for everyone. So we need to be inclusive and ask people what kind of support they need and not make any assumptions about gender or any other kind of um, indicator. At an organizational level, Ron and I have done some research together about uncertain times and let's face it, we are in uncertain times. And actually here, having some formalization helps because it gives people the stability to come up with new and innovative ideas. So here are some guidelines. This is how we do things. This is what is accepted and familiar. And that might actually help people to deal with the chaos that is happening outside. And of course, in higher education, right now we are preparing for the next academic year. And there are all sorts of uncertainty. So here I want to finish with that, you know, also again, um, um, echoing some of the things that Ron um, has said that on the, in the big scheme of things, I think the British and the Dutch are, are doing quite well. You know, we've got global social mobility, something that higher education is, of course, very interested in. And then we've got world happiness. And there we are. The Dutch and the British are quite close together in, you know, on, on a global level. So I think we've got so much potential. And I really hope that our universities will work better together and that we will work better together in uh, the organizations to advance um, everyone. Um, and I want to finish with this image. It's hangs in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. Um, and it's about the Dutch and the British being rather merry. And so that must reflect that indulgence school. Um, the sea is open, the trade can continue. So I hope you enjoyed this talk and thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Natalie. So, so much food for thought there. Starting with kind of a good warning against sophisticated stereotyping, which is a very nice, nice phrase. And I have to say, as an engineer, I really could have enjoyed seeing the Dutch directness plotted in the bar chart. Again, graphical proof of our, of our personal stereotypes. And I very much like the kind of warning, well, advised towards the end to work in uh, multidisciplinary teams. So thank you. Um, I think we've got a little bit of room for a question because some good questions came in through the uh, Q&A. So please people do use the Q&A. Um, this is a question to both uh, Ron and Natalie. So it's from Bart. Uh, obviously a, a huge criticism on intercultural research is the self-reported observational data. With the rise of big data and better ways to measure behavioral and cognitive data, how do you see these opportunities and limitations in confirming or rejecting uh, existing theories. So I don't know if Ron or Natalie wants to jump on that. You can also read it in the Q and A if you, if you wish. I think Ron would be very good in a very good position to, because this is one of those things uh, we discuss quite a lot, um, right? So what is the validity of self-report? Um, and I think that's a very valid point. Ron, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, happy to jump in. Um, there was also this other comment, I don't see it right now in front of me, uh, which also went along similar lines. Can we trust what people tell us? And I can assure you, you know, like, I 
typically do not trust surveys, uh, but they are a good starting point to get an idea of what is going on. Um, so for me, the, the question is always, if there's a pattern coming through, for example, surveys based on, for example, representative or nicely matched um, data, you know, like it's a good starting point to explore ideas. Um, the same way that a doctor would, you know, like not take whatever a patient is saying at face value, but you have to start somewhere. And to come back to the idea of both the self-report versus actual behavior and the big data, um, the, some of the theories that I talked about, they hold up pretty well on a global rate when you start looking at actual objective indicators, for example, innovation, creativity rates. So looking again at that big picture that the ambassador talked about at the UN level. Um, so some of those theories do work at that global level well. And what we have to do then is, you know, like start bringing that down to specific contextual uh, institutional environments and then figure out what is going on there. Um, if if it doesn't fit what we would expect, that is great because that tells us there's something we can learn and, and can improve on our both the theories and, and the, the practice. With the big data, I'm a big fan of big data and you know like together with colleagues we we do a lot of stuff on for example um, social media, Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. My problem with that is it is just another type of talk, <laughs> if, you, if you know what I mean. And so, you know, like we're, we're switching one kind of problem with another type of problem. If we start using, for example, mobility data um, together with uh, some people in computer science, uh, we are looking at mobility data, for example, in the context context of COVID, um, again, you know, like you're getting a different kind of snapshot on, on a very complex problem. And so the mobility data gives you additional insights, but you know, like you then also have to bring it back to, for example, the reasons of why people may have moved on particular days in particular directions, right? So um, it, it just shifts the, the problem a little bit. So ultimately bringing us back to the Tim Burton question, you know, we have to basically triangulate our data and ask these different questions, um, interrogating our data in a systematic way. Thank you very much. That was a very clear answer to that question. Um, I'm gonna to have to draw the Q&A to a close um, because we all move to the panel discussion. But I would like to thank all of our speakers, so Ron, Natalie, and also the ambassador for their wonderful presentations. And it's also a good way to start our uh, panel discussion. We had planned a brief break, but I think we've overrun ever so slightly. Um, so I think we'll move directly into to the panel uh, discussion. So could I ask the panel members to uh, turn their video on whilst I switch the screen? Um, so we have a we've assembled a panel today uh, with a why people have a wide range of experience of working in the UK uh, and the Netherlands and in academic, uh, academically in those areas. So I'll ask uh, each one of you to briefly introduce yourself uh, and your kind of your background in the sense of give, give people a sense of what uh, your experiences have been uh, between the Netherlands and the UK in, in academic circles. And I'll keep an eye out on the chat to uh, ask questions. So, uh, I might as well start in this order. Um, Anna, are you happy to give you a brief introduction? Oh, well, my name is Anna Watts. I'm Professor of High Energy Astrophysics at the University of Amsterdam, um, but I was born in Scotland. I grew up in Yorkshire. Um, I did my bachelor and my PhD in the UK. I also had five years working for the British government, which is a whole different story in between there as well. Um, then moved to the US and to Germany for postdocs before coming to the Netherlands as a postdoc first in 2008, um, and then joining the faculty and never leaving. Um, Mostly prompted by Brexit, I'm now a Dutch citizen. So I'm actually no longer a British citizen because I had to give up my passport. Um, and so, yeah, my family are, are well settled um, in Utrecht and my two kids are growing up Dutch. Thank you very much. Um, Monique, can I ask you? Yes, of course. I'm Monique Tromp. I'm professor of materials chemistry at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. I did my PhD in chemistry in the Netherlands, in Utrecht. And I, after my PhD, I moved to the UK. 
uh, to Southampton where I did a postdoc and after a few years I was able to obtain an EPSDC advanced research fellowship. So I became a lecturer and I worked uh, at the University of Southampton, but also partly in Oxford at the Diamond Light Source. Uh, and all in all, I stayed in the UK for six years, after which I moved to Germany. Uh, a similar route as Anna, we found out later, but a few years apart, and, and I'm now back in the Netherlands. So. Thank you, uh, Monique. Uh, Rob? Yes. Um... Robert van Dersen, I'm, uh, I was born in the Netherlands uh, out of an English mother and a Dutch father. I uh, have uh, worked as a physiotherapist and then moved into academia to study movement sciences. And for the last 24 years, I've been working in Cardiff University uh, as, and now as a professor of rehabilitation sciences. Uh, I have recently moved back to the Netherlands, uh, end of 2019, uh, a big uh, stick that moved me was Brexit, uh, but I actually am still employed at Cardiff University. I'm supposed to be commuting back and forth, uh, but that seems to have been halted because of the COVID. So I'm experiencing some very interesting complications in my life, uh, moving between the UK and the Netherlands. Thank you, Rob. Uh, anu, are you here? Yes, yes, I am. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, Yes, um, um, I don't really know what to say because I feel like I'm a bit of an outlier because I'm, I'm not Dutch and I'm also not British. So, uh, but I, I worked in Holland for two years um, and now I've been in the UK for five years. So, um, so I kind of know both places, but of course, um, as I said, um, I'm from Estonia to start to. Well, it's, I'm a professor at the, uh, of psychology at the University of Warwick. Um, I do research on personality and also on cross-cultural differences. So, um, so I think one could say that I have some theoretical as well as some first-hand uh, practical expertise, uh, what it is uh, to live in these two countries and what are the difficulties and what are the differences as well as similarities. Um, I did my postdoc in Belgium, uh, which is uh, not too far from Holland. And also I've lived and worked in different Scandinavian countries before I, I came to the UK. So, uh, so far it's been super interesting um, and I look forward to this uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, Maike? Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Maike. I'm a PhD student at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I moved to the UK beginning of 2019 uh, for my PhD. And before that, I did an undergraduate in the Netherlands and then moved to Germany for my master's and did uh, a short world tour of the US and Switzerland before finally landing in the UK. It's a wonderfully diverse and rich kind of international history for a lot of these academic careers we're, we're listening to. Um, so I've got a, kind of a starting question, um, and it's got a similar to the one that was posted in the Q&A by Lara. Uh, what's been the biggest difference in cultural differences between the British and the Dutch that you've encountered? And Lara's version, what was the most awkward situation you've encountered uh, in, in terms of intercultural differences? Um, anyone wants to start with that one? Anna, please go ahead. I think the biggest cultural difference, I think, is the one that's been mentioned about directness. I mean, that for me has been a revelation. I had a slight head start being in Germany for two years before I came to the Netherlands of, of recalibrating that you should never. I said to a student once, you know, you, you might want to try it this way again, meaning this is how you're going to do it. And he just he thought, oh, I might and then never did it. And I was bemused by this happening. So that took me a while. So now, you know, after being in the Netherlands for you know multiple years, I would never use that language. And I'm quite proud that for the first time, about three weeks ago, I got a message from someone saying that email was a bit, bit too direct. And that is my absolute top achievement to finally breached Dutch directness boundary the other direction. Um, most embarrassing moment, I think, kind of ties into that a little bit, because I think the British have a slight tendency that we like complaining and whinging, but without any intention that anyone will ever do anything about it. You know, we just like to have a good moan. And I think very quickly after I'd arrived in the Netherlands, an incident had happened and I was moaning about it to a couple of friends. Dutch colleague heard it, so I'm gonna fix it. 
immediately sent an email saying, Anna is British and therefore could never tell you she is upset. And I was absolutely mortified <laughs> because I would never ever have said a word about this to anyone. But I promptly got apologies and blah, blah, blah. And it was, yeah, it was mortifying, absolutely mortifying. Never done it again. Judging by the expressions of various people on camera, they, they recognize this uh, <laughs> very much. Um, Monique, would you like to add anything to that? Coming from the other way, basically. Yeah, I, th I think for me, language was the same as well. And I actually, I thought I spoke English really well when I moved to the UK. And then I came in Southampton where everyone swallows half of the words. So the first few weeks I couldn't understand a thing. So I felt a bit, little bit isolated. Um, what I also, in, in the first few meetings at the university, I also thought at the end of a meeting, nothing had been decided. And that's again, this language thing. So I would come out of a meeting and then I thought, what have we just done? Because nothing has been decided. But then you learn that everything was decided in between the lines if you start to understand the language. Uh, so, so that's maybe not very awkward, but that is something I, I <laughs> learned to, yeah, to, I learned, I guess, I learned to interpret uh, the language, all the examples which have been men mentioned as well. The other thing, maybe more of a, um, a personal non-work related thing is that in the Netherlands, so I came, I, I did my PhD in, in the Netherlands and I was a student there and so what you do if you meet up, you meet up at home and you drink at home. And of course, you would go out as well, but you have dinner at home and then you might go out. And, and in the UK, getting to someone's home, that at least that was my experience, is a big hurdle. So you meet in the pub and really, if they really, uh, if you have a real connection and that takes a while, only then you're invited to the house. So that is also a very different thing, which I have to yeah, I guess go through and it's understandable hindsight, but that was something when I came to the UK, I thought that's awkward. We never see each other at home and that is something I was used to. So uh... I think that's something we're all all aware of. I was going to, was going to ask Mike on that because most recently graduated, I think, I think from the, the panel. Uh, that kind of transition from being a Dutch student to an English, well, a Dutch PhD student in England, how did you find that transition? Because that sounds like a very recognizable story just now. Yeah, um, I was very happy that uh, a friend of mine who was previously went to the UK gave me a how to write an email with, <laughs> because in the Netherlands we're again very direct with, um, or there was a little bit of Germanness in me where I had very formal greeting. So, dear professor, this and this. And then I went like straight for the, could you send me the article you mentioned? And then it was best wishes me again. And I did that for a good month, I think, before someone finally pointed out that it's very polite to first ask how they are. So you, you get the traditional, I hope you are well and uh, hope you have a nice weekend and everything. And then you sort of by a three roundabouts politely ask them to send you the article. Um, that one was was quite different for me as well. Um, and the the again the, the politeness where they ask you, well, like your supervisor will ask you, um, do you have time to do this class or take over this class? And in the beginning, I would go like, no, I don't have time. And then they sort of look at you because they expect you to say yes, of course, because that's the sort of polite way for them to tell you, take over my class. So that, that was a big uh, transition in the beginning. So a lot, of, a lot about misunderstanding and yeah, communication. I think the ambassador also referred to, what do you mean when you actually raise this question? Turning to you, Rob, you've, you've kind of grown up a bit in between cultures in a way. Yeah. Well, I, I thought I was well prepared when I went to Cardiff. Um, I've been in the UK many times over from when I was six months old to visit my grandparents. So I thought I knew what was uh, supposed to happen when you live in the UK. Besides that, I've been working in places like Africa and Asia and studying in the United States. So I learned about culture shock and all of that sort of thing. And I thought, well, no way is there any chance that there will be a culture shock in the UK. And I have to admit, because of the subtlety, that was the hardest bit to actually get to grips with is that actually I didn't understand despite having been brought up half English anyway, 
um, I found that you know the the ability to say things indirectly is just uh, the number of phrases that exist uh, to say things indirectly is you know uh, there's no end to it. And a famous example is my wife, who's Dutch actually, who was in hospital with a patient who was uh, somewhat demented, and she wanted to spend a penny. And my wife thought that she wanted to go to a shop and, and purchase something, but actually that's a way to say that you need to go to the toilet. And so that obviously made the patient very uncomfortable. Um, but there are so many different ways of saying things that even if you have you know, spent 20 years keeping track of all these variations, you still find yourself the next day finding out that there's yet another way to say things and to confuse. Uh, so I, I think this lost in translation is a big deal. Um, I do think that the British think that they're the only ones who have a sense of humor. So that means that if you don't seem to understand something, uh, it must be because you don't have a sense of humor. And, and that sort of is difficult sometimes to actually to get to grips with. Uh, they don't have the only, uh, they're, they're not the only ones to have that sense of humor. Uh, embarrassment, the mistake I made once is to break into a conversation when we were in a pub where people were arguing how lowly their uh, offspring was, you know, their, their upbringing was. They had an outside toilet and it just got worse and worse and worse. And the game was to say how, how bad you had it when you were young. And I got a bit fed up with that and I, I started to def define that that was actually what they were doing. And that obviously is just a social game, I guess. And you're not supposed to break into that by, by naming it uh, and to, to declare that that actually is what they're doing. Um, and so I, I do find that you don't interfere with the, the sense of humor that the British share a lot with each other. And they assume that you're an outsider in that respect, no matter what you do. I, I, I guess that the lost in translation is the most recognizable to me. And I think a general theme I've heard from all the kind of people who've been in the Netherlands and the UK is the directness, which I think we all kind of saw coming. We did get a pre-submitted question around this. Uh, I'm paraphrasing slightly, but if I'm too direct or blunt for the British, but now too polite for the Dutch, help, what do I do? Any advice on that? I think Anna could have mentioned something along those lines earlier. Any advice for somebody who feels, yeah, too blunt for the British and too polite for the Dutch? Um. I might be able to, because the, the Dutch bluntness, it's more so within the like um, city areas and everywhere. So I'm from the south of the Netherlands, very rural, and we tend to be a bit softer around. So you might want to move outside of the big cities and go a bit more rural. We tend to be a little bit less blunt than, still blunt for uh, UK standards, but a little bit less blunt compared to other Dutch people. Fair enough. <laughs> Moving away from just the Dutch uh, character characterization, a bit more general, uh, I think it's a question for Anu, I think. So given how international academia has become, can we still speak of, say, a UK academic culture or a Dutch academic culture, given that we're surrounded by international colleagues? So what's been your experience in that, in that regard? Well, I think it's a really good question because um, I think in all universities in the UK, I think we have up to 40%, you know, people from different countries. So in that sense, um, I think UK universities are very international. But at the same time, I think there are still very specific ways we do things, which I would say are specific to the UK or at least England, which I know better. Um, and the same goes for the Netherlands. It kind of shines through you know, the underlying structure, the cultural values and sense of forth. So even though, of course, all these international people are contributing, you know, how universities work and, and how academia works, but at the same time, students, to a large extent, you know, they are from the UK, even though, again, the number of international students, especially from overseas, mm. is growing as we speak, but at the same time, um, they kind of define the scene as well because they come from the English or British schools or the presets of our use, you know, the, the way they know things are supposed to happen. So, so yeah, I'd say yes and no, and, and yes to yes, I think we can still see a UK-specific 
academic culture. And that is definitely one of the things that shocked me when I came to the UK. Uh, when Rob uh, described his experiences, I was thinking like he was talking about me because I'm, I'm a cross-cultural psychologist and I, I'm embarrassed to say that I wasn't expecting all the differences. I, I Everything I had done earlier, all the places I had worked and lived, I never really experienced anything like this, but somehow I was completely swept off my feet when I came to the UK and I wasn't prepared for this. So, um, and it had everything to do with how, I think how the universities work because they are highly structured. There are so many rules and guidelines and things. You need to know what's important and what is not important, but you can't know this before you know what's important, if you see what I mean, because the, the guidelines and regulations are like hundreds of pages of everything, and it's overwhelming because it's terrifying to start it because you're afraid of making mistakes and not following some guidelines. So you need to understand that maybe it's just like one page which is important, but how could you know if you don't know the culture as, you know, Ron explains and uh, the ambassador explains in his speech and so, and so forth. And also, uh, maybe it's not exactly related to what you just asked from me, but it's one of the topics I wanted to raise because I don't think anyone has mentioned it so far. I really struggle to sort of with those uh, visible and invisible social class lines because we haven't really talked about the importance of social class in the mm -hmm. UK. Um, and, and, and again, maybe I, I didn't simply, maybe the more I study, I think the less I understand anyhow, but I think I didn't have a similar problem when I was living in Holland. Maybe I was ignorant, but in the UK, I'm still trying to understand how it all works. And, you know, understanding that, you know, it's, you have to come from a public school, which is in fact a private school, you know, the importance of this and, you know, low levels of social mobility and the importance of a postcode and, you know, all sorts of things, you know, which kind of define who you are, what you do, what is it you're supposed to do, how it matters. And even as a social scientist and having read so much about social mobility, which is also quite low, as I understand, in the UK as compared to the Netherlands, um, I'm still sort of struggling to understand how it all works. And I think it's a defining feature of this society where we, where I am right now. So. I think it's one of those things that uh, somebody teaching in, in a UK university, this idea of what kind of school you came from is something I would never ask myself in the Netherlands. It's something that you, it, it's almost irrelevant, like, but as you, as you point out, whether it's public or private makes a, uh, uh, a big difference. I guess a, a uh, question for you, for you again, I think, as a starting point, what's, because you're neither Dutch nor British and most people here are a bit of both. <laughs> Um, what's been what's the biggest difference you found working in academia in the Netherlands and the UK as a kind of an, an outsider in a way? Well, I think it's exactly what I said about everything being super structured in a way. I think uh, Dutch bureaucracy is amazing, but at the same time, I think the way it, at least in my opinion, works in the UK, it's it's it goes beyond everything what I've seen before. In any of these countries, you know, um, it's it's um, and also maybe the other thing, at least based on my opinion, uh, the biggest difference is that I think UK universities are a bit more international, as you said before, and this international environment is kind of like we're living in a some kind of bubble, you know, because. There are people from all different parts of the world and 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 at the end of the day doesn't we all speak English and and sometimes you know local people are in a minority so uh, so it's a very international group of people but in in the Netherlands at least in the department and in the places I worked at it's it's it was less international so of course everybody speaks uh, English very fluently 
But at the end of the day, you know, it kind of switches back to Dutch very easily. And, and I think in that sense, you know, working in the UK, having this really large group of international academics um, around you, uh, I think it's, it kind of um, it feels a bit more global, maybe. So, um, and of course, the main thing, uh, I think, is related to money. And we don't really want to talk about money, but I think it makes, it makes a huge difference to the atmosphere because, because um, as you will know, the British students pay rather hefty tuition fees and that changes the whole atmosphere you know, of the academic setting because uh, in the Netherlands, the tuition fee is still rather small or rather low. Um, and, and in that sense, I think that students are much more easygoing in a way, less nervous, less anxious, are uh, also more independent. And, you know, this whole atmosphere is, is kind of like, there is less stress because students are not paying so much money to get what they want to get, which is a good education. And, and, and they are not as demanding maybe as I'd say British students are, and rightly so, because they pay loads of money in order to be educated by us. So, yeah. yeah that, that, that makes sense. Anyone else want to kind of add to that, Monique, please? Yeah, so so about your diff uh, your question about the differences at university. I mean, for me, the UK was the perfect start of my academic career because we, we spoke about hierarchy, etc. And maybe mm -hmm. in, in normal life in the UK, that is more than in the Netherlands. But in the academic system, I felt when I came in as a postdoc that everyone was kind of equal. Um, the students would approach the professors with their first name. It was the same basis almost. Uh, and, and you could become uh, independent very quickly. So as soon as I became a lecturer, I had my own independent group. I could promote my own people. In the Netherlands, that is slowly changing. I have to say now as well that, that that's only since last year. But there you have to be under a full professor to get these promotion rights, let's say. So there's much more hierarchy. So you're much more stuck to a professor before you can start your own independent research and and like i said it is changing but for me at that time the uk was the perfect setting because i was equal and and at the same time i mean there are a lot of measures were and still are in in the uk uh, with these athena swan awards etc about diversity and and the netherlands is conceived very open and diverse but in academia and and anna can <laughs> Uh, add if she wants, but I mean, especially in, in the fields we're working in, it's not so diverse and it's not so open. And um, so for me, the, yeah, the diversity, but also the equality within the university was perfect for a start of my career. I went went to Germany after and that's, well, I, I think the Netherlands is in between Germany and the UK in a way. In Germany, you have to fill in a form before you start to think about doing something. So Anna was saying it's it's uh, she felt this isn't complicated in the UK. Well, compared to Germany, I don't find the UK complicated um, and it's very hierarchical. And then I, I wrote emails to my students just on the signing best wishes Monique, but they wouldn't know because they they were not used to say Monique to their professor. They would say Frau Professorin. Trump, let's say, so that, that there's much more dif uh, distance. So that that I find very striking, and that for me was a perfect way to start my academic career in the UK. I, I recognize that. I was, going to, I was going to link that to Micah, perhaps, because you made you made a point earlier, Micah, around uh, when, you, when your supervisor asked politely whether you might have time to do something, which was, could you please do this? How have you experienced the hierarchy in the UK? Um, it's, it's a lot less than what I expected it to be. Um, I thought there was, there was going to be a bit more, again, from a sort of, um, stereo, British stereotype of sir and ma'am and everything. Um, but it's, it's actually really refreshing to get, uh, especially working with first years undergrad students where you, you sit down and you talk and there isn't really the, the sort of distance in the Netherlands, you sort of try to keep yourself a little bit above the students sometimes, especially with young early career researchers uh, have a tendency to do that. And again, maybe also language thing where in Dutch, we still have a formal U, 
uh, which it is not in the UK. And you, you get on a much better personal level with your students, I find here in the UK than I would do in the Netherlands. Again, I think I saw quite a few nodding faces from the screen, so I think people recognise themselves in that description. Uh, time is running out very rapidly. Uh, we could keep going for quite a while, I think, but I think we probably want to draw this to a close. Um, could I ask everyone of you to think of a bit of advice if you were to move, for somebody to move either to the UK or to the Netherlands in, to work in higher education or research, whichever way you want to go, or um, any, one bit of advice you would give to anyone crossing the pond? Um, Anna, shall we start with you? Yes, I think one thing coming in as a, a foreign academic into the Netherlands is that there is an international English speaking master's course bubble. And then there is the bachelor education Dutch culture bubble as well. And it's taken me more than a decade to get across from one to the other. Because at the beginning of the Corona crisis, so just before it, I became program director for our bachelor degree, having had no experience of teaching in the bachelor, and was suddenly dropped into what felt like a different world. You know, majority Dutch language, loads more Dutch cultural interaction. And I think a lot of foreign academics find themselves trapped in this master's teaching, everything's in English, bringing in research grants side of things. And it is a real push to get across that both socially and within the academic environment. So I think my, my advice would be find a way to cross that barrier sooner rather than later, because it's great actually. I mean, it's made it's been like a completely new university experience. I mean, not just because of the Corona crisis, but also because of that as well, actually, to get across that barrier. Very nice. And Monique, would you like to add anything to that? Well, I think I just want to add to Anna that it differs a little bit because I'm in Groningen now and there the bachelor is also in English. So that helps because we have now international people starting and they go straight into the bachelor. So that that, of course, helps. But that's that's special to Groningen, I guess. I mean, for me, um, I guess maybe more the other way around. So yeah, speak to people about these language and subtleties, et cetera, those differences. So that you're aware before you actually go that if you do go into a meeting, you understand that decisions are being made uh, and, and how that is uh, phrased. So, so get, yeah, and maybe start, start reading. I've, I've read loads of English books and then you get, start to get familiar with the real British English. It was actually quite funny that when I started moving, um, when I moved to Germany after I was teaching classes in English as well, and they didn't like it because it wasn't American enough. So the Germans are then again used to the American English apparently. So the British English was too complicated. So, uh, but yeah, yeah, just just um, talk to colleagues and, and get to know where you get into and learn this language sooner rather than later. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I'm trying to think very hard about this one. Um, my experience is that you don't have to become British if you're, I'm thinking about working in the UK. So I've never projected myself as, you know, Dutch tend to want to dissolve into the culture that they are joining um, and, and adapt and all of that sort of thing. And uh, I've noticed that it is quite, possible to stay quite Dutch. So uh, to be blunt, sometimes it's very helpful if you're in a meeting that doesn't seem to be going anywhere. Uh, they appreciate that there is some, you know, whatever, I'm tempted to say some things, but some Dutchman who is quite willing to perhaps speak out what nobody dares to say and things like that. Uh, and so I don't think it is purely about respecting each other's culture. You can play with it. Um, I've you know, I've witnessed all sorts of social gaming that goes on around you and you don't have to become the same. You can just recognize the pattern, so to speak, and stay closer to how you bro were brought up yourself and to perhaps, you know, uh, define it a little bit as to what you're seeing. Uh, and I don't find that you have to uh, be scared of just interacting as the person who you are. Uh, and you find that one thing I found is that I find myself very much interacting between the international students and my British colleagues who don't always seem to have moved beyond the boundaries of their own city, let alone the country. And having been around myself quite a bit, uh, you start to see where there are some problems in communication. And I, I think that 
uh, these cultural differences don't have to be barriers. You can actually learn to work with them and play with them. That's a nice one. I'll remember that for the next difficult meeting. Uh, Micah? Um, yeah, just to say to Rob, you do sometimes get pushed forward as you ask that question, you're Dutch, you, you, you can do this, which I would say is something that you, sh you actually should embrace. Yeah, we do have a tendency to sort of dissolve and uh, yeah, be normal within your new normal setting. That's, uh, don't be that weird, but um, my, my top tip would be to, um, to try and speak to as many people as possible because we have a sort of, again, a, a stereotype of what a UK person is, but there is not a, a single person. Even within a university, there's a host of different personalities and people going on. And the more you speak with different people, the more you sort of get a, a sense of, uh, of what the country is really like. Thank you. And Anu, as a last kind of advice for either going to the Netherlands or the UK, any tips you would give? Um, I think both countries are quite amazing in different ways and you just have to you just have to know that although they are quite similar in many respects as you know our speakers showed us you know research has shown that broadly speaking you know if you look at the UK and Holland in terms of Hofstede as they mentioned you know they are quite similar but at the same time there are some crucial differences which are also uh, can be quite nice. So I'd be open to all sorts of differences and similarities, but I would acknowledge that, you know, you have to, you have to understand it's not the same place you're going, um, even though it's very close, um, I don't know, 50 minutes by plane, um, but they are both amazing, amazing in different ways. And the more you know about the place, the better. And, and if there are some communication issues, you know, it's absolutely normal because uh, you can use it uh, on your advantage or, you know, if you don't want to stand out, you can learn to, I don't know, speak more directly or indirectly as needed, but you can still be yourself. So if you think that it's a good position, I would definitely, uh, for your career, for your family and so on and so forth, I would definitely go and do it regardless of all the differences and similarities we've been talking about, because I think it's a very enriching experience, you know, to work in another country. And, and I think all of us, we can sort of uh, say that in a way, you know, uh, it's been a great experience to be able to live and work in both of these countries. I think it's a wonderfully positive note to, uh, to finish on. Uh, Make, make use of the experience of going abroad and both the Netherlands and the UK have their uh, upsides and downsides. Well, thank you very much uh, to the entire panel for your time and sharing your experiences. It's been a wonderful uh, well, mirror in a way to learn a bit, but not just me, but also all, all the Dutch people and English people in these, in these countries are experiencing. So thank you very much for uh, joining us in the panel. And also this kind of wraps up our uh, webinar. Again, also thank the ambassador, uh, Ron and Natalie, for their talks. And yeah, this draws to the close uh, our webinar. If you are interested in following more of our activities from Dutch Academic Network, please visit our website and become a member. But other than that, I think that uh, closes today's, uh, today's webinar. Thank you very much for attending. <laughs>